Hey everyone, welcome back to Wicked Deeds. We're your hosts, I'm Brittany. And I'm John. And today we'll be discussing the case of a husband and wife living in a small Vermont town who were found shot to death inside their home. As police scoured the community for answers, they soon found themselves at an impasse. With the lack of physical evidence and no clear motive for this heinous act, the investigation into these two deaths grew cold, and along with it, coverage began to cease. So now, over three decades later, it's far past due to bring some attention to what happened. Today's case is about the murder of Roland and Maram Hanel. On Thursday, September 20th, 1984, a friend of Roland and Maram Hanel stopped by their house around 4.30 p.m. However, when this friend stepped into the multi-level house located on Gendron Road in Jay, Vermont, they were met with a horrific scene. 49-year-old Roland was found laying on his stomach in the living room, clearly deceased from what was believed to be gunshot wounds. Maram, Roland's wife, who was 32 at the time, was also found deceased, presumably killed in the same fashion, but her body was found laying on her back in the kitchen. The Orleans County PD was called to the scene immediately, and from the very start, in order to try and nail down some semblance of an idea of what may have happened to the Hanels, they needed to get to know the victims and their lives. So, let's back up a little bit. Roland Hanel was born in Germany, and at some point ended up moving to Canada, specifically Montreal, where he became a Canadian citizen. In 1969, he began living part-time in the Jay, Vermont area. It's reported that he'd built a home in the popular ski resort town. It seemed as though this was a convenient spot for Roland because the distance from Jay to the Canadian border is only about 15 miles, plus the drive from Montreal, where he was living and running his business, was only about two hours. And speaking of Roland's business, he owned what seemed to be a successful plastics company. However, sometime around 1981, it's unclear if it happened that year or sometime before, but Roland decided to sell his business. Then, also in 1981, Roland married his second wife, Maram. She was originally from Egypt, but later became a Canadian citizen. She was roughly in her late 20s when she and Roland had met and later married. After the couple had wed, it's reported that they both moved into one of the properties Roland had previously built in Jay, Vermont. And I say one of because it is reported that he owned at least two houses in the area, both of which I believe he built himself. Also, I do just want to say that it's not really clear if Roland sold his business due to his new marriage or if there were other extenuating circumstances that caused him to make that decision. But either way, it seemed like things were working out and the couple appeared to be very happy. Yeah, well, if he had a successful plastic business, mm -hmm. maybe he was like, all right, I can make enough off of this, off of the sale of it. Mm -hmm. Live a comfortable life with my new wife. Yep. Just start a new venture. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, so now let's discuss Jay, Vermont a little bit, as I think it's important to know what the area was like. It is a very tight-knit and small community. Back in 1984, there were only about 300 permanent residents, and that amount hasn't increased all that much, because as of the 2020 census, the number of individuals living in Jay only jumped up to about 551. And the thing about Jay, the fact that it's a popular vacation spot, specifically during ski season, was that most people lived there, or the people that lived nearby to the Hanels in general, were there pretty much only during the weekends. I had also mentioned that Roland had built at least two houses in the area. I do believe that he'd built the first one back in 1969, and sometime between then and when he met Maram, he'd built a second house, this one located on Gendron Road. However, I will say it's a little unclear, but from what I've pieced together, I think that both houses may have been in the same area or potentially even on the same property. Now, the property that was built later, again, the one that's for sure on Gendron Road and the one where the couple's bodies would later be found, was very secluded. I haven't been able to nail down exactly which house on Gendron Road this one is, but just based on photos of what the house looked like and an aerial map, I've come to the conclusion that I believe it to be 894 Gendron Road. 
But again, this is just based on some minimal sleuthing because unfortunately there are no property records online for Jay Vermont. I'm not 100% positive if the house is in fact 894 Gendron Road, so please take that with a grain of salt. There also isn't a street view available of this road on Google Maps, so that made it a bit more difficult as well, but just based on the aerial view of Gendron Road, I can see why there isn't a street view because it would just legit be trees. Yeah, I mean, looking at this aerial view through Google, Mm -hmm. if the population hasn't increased very much to only like 550 people nowadays, yeah. There's probably not a lot more industry even now. Yep, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's like the vast wilderness of Vermont over there. Probably, if I'm imagining this correctly, if it's like a ski resort area, you probably have people that are, you know, part-time residents. Mm -hmm. And then they rent out their properties to people coming for vacations or to coming to ski for certain times of the year. Yes, exactly. The houses that the Hanels owned were described as chalets, which according to the Oxford Dictionary is a quote, wooden house with a roof that slopes steeply down over the sides, usually built in mountain areas, especially in Switzerland, end quote. Yeah, when you hear that word chalet, or at least when I hear it, I think of like a ski resorts, like a ski chalet or a, a house with a steep roof. And then it would be almost those um, like scalloped. Yeah, like the uh, roof. Roof, like uh, the edge, like it's scalloped underneath the mm-hmm. gutters. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. I also like have this picture in my mind, too. And maybe that's just because it's like the New England area and where it's like, you know, more rural or things like that. I think of like a log cabin. Like that's what comes to my mind. But that's also kind of not what their house looked like to me. But from what I can tell regarding their house, I do believe that it may have been a multi-unit because Roland and Maram were renting out at least one other floor, maybe even two other floors of the house. Again, this is just like yet another aspect of this case that's not totally clear. But not only did they rent the other floors and units of the house that they were living in on Gendron Road, but they also rented out the other house they owned in the area, the one that Roland had built back in 69. The houses were rented the majority of the time during the ski season rather than other parts of the year as they were located pretty close to the popular ski resort in the area. One of the houses that you have pictured here? Yeah. It does look like a multi-level thing where Mm -hmm. the base floor probably has a full kitchen and bathroom and everything. Yep. And then the top also has probably something similar. Yes, exactly. That's what it looks like to me, especially the one that shows like the side of the house where you can see the door, Mm -hmm. like both doors like on top of each other. That's You have like a deck. Yeah, Yeah, that's, that's, I agree with that. So one thing that I'm surprised that you hadn't asked yet had to do with the fact that they rented these units out and if anybody was actually living in them or renting them out when they were killed. Well, I would assume that you get there if there's pertinent information. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Don't want to jump to conclusions yet. Hey, I don't know. You ask a lot of questions like right when I'm about to tell them. So I was surprised that you didn't get there yet. But it was not rented at the time. It was just them living in the property. You have to consider too, it's September. So it's probably not like quite ski season yet. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. With Vermont, I mean, maybe it could be closer to November. Yeah, I feel like it would be like more so later on in the year. So I had also seen it reported that they may have even lived in the basement or the first floor of this house. So I'm not totally sure like regarding how many units there were. But you have to think like if they were living in the basement of the house, like they were trying to make as much money from this as they could. Right. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, I think of a place that we went to before where we stayed. And we had like the whole house yeah. together. And mm-hmm. then the people that owned the property while you were staying there stayed in the basement. Yeah, that's true. Yep. So I didn't think about it that way. That's a very good point. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you have the whole run of this massive property or yeah. however big theirs was, but you have like the whole house available to you mm. while they have, you know, just what they need, the necessities down in the basement. Yeah. And I mean, I'm sure it's still like furnished and, right. you know, it's not like they're living in concrete walls Squalor. and all yeah. <laughs> this. Yeah, exactly. So. But, I mean, regardless of all the specifics on how many floors there were, how many units they were able to rent out, I wanted to go back to something else that I had mentioned a bit earlier, and that was the fact that Roland had sold his plastics business back in 81. After he sold the business, he and his wife were described as being in, quote, semi-retirement, and that Roland had mentioned that he was planning to live off the interest from the sale of his business, as well as all the rents he planned to receive from the properties he owned. Which is kind of what I was thinking where... Yep. You sell it, you make enough, you don't have to work too hard anymore. Yep. Then you tell me that they have these rental properties. Yep. Should be more than enough to exactly live comfortably at least. Yeah, and it didn't appear like they were looking for a new job or anything like that. It seemed like they were just making it work with the money they had at the time. So it must have been, you know, 
a lucrative enough business that he got a fair amount of money for it to be able to, you know, live your life like that. Well, sure. Say you, you know, you make enough off of the interest Mm -hmm. when interest rates were actually pretty decent, probably in (laughs) savings accounts and stuff. Probably. So you make enough off of that for like your everyday expenses. And then even if you're just paying off your mortgage by doing these renters, Mm -hmm. it's like it works. It works. And then you can just be frugal in other ways if you need to be. Mm hmm. And I will say they did seem to be doing all right enough because Roland also owned a boat that he kept down in Florida. And unfortunately, I haven't been able to find anything about them potentially owning a home down there. But it was stated that they spent winters in Florida. So, I mean, it is definitely possible or they could have rented a place. But either way, they spent winter time down there. Yeah. And even if, you know, during the winter, I'm sure their rental properties are more in in higher demand. Yep, exactly. So they could be offsetting the cost of them traveling down to Florida mm-hmm. in the winter yep. with the money that they're making from the rental properties. Yeah, I mean, hey, they seem to be pretty smart with their money. So, mm-hmm. and I did actually see it mentioned that they were relatively frugal, like not totally pinching pennies and worrying about every cent that they spent, but they weren't extravagant. And I think that goes back to them potentially, you know, living in the basement in the house and then also. If they're traveling down to Florida, then, you know, they're getting more for rent, all of that. So it seems like they were doing whatever they could to make the most amount of of money possible. Right. Especially if you're in partial retirement. Yeah. Semi-retirement. I was like, oh, must be nice. I (laughs) love that. (laughs) I did also see it reported that the couple did have a car, which was said to be a VW Rabbit, but they didn't drive it very much. And I don't think that actually necessarily was a decision of theirs to save money. You see, the couple had been described as very athletic, and it's reported that they enjoyed skiing, obviously due to the area they chose to live in, and they also enjoyed other sports as well, like tennis and biking. A neighbor of the Hanels even told the Burlington Free Press, quote, Roland was the type of guy who would ride his bike or jog if he had to go to the store and never used his car, end quote. People that lived in the area did seem to really like the Hanels, even though it was stated that they didn't spend a ton of time around town. But there was a woman who lived in the Jay area and her husband owned a local grocery store there. And she stated the following that was reported in the Gazette. She stated, quote, they were nice people. She was in here a lot. She was always joyful, end quote. All right, so now that you have some semblance of an idea of Roland and Maram's life, let's get back to the investigation into their murder. First of all, Detective Corporal Peter Johnson was the lead detective on the case, but there were two other individuals who seemed to be mentioned in the media more frequently, and they gave quite a few comments to the press in terms of how the investigation was going, one of which was Vermont State Police Sergeant Sid Adams. He'd given a few key details to the Rutland Daily Herald about the scene of the crime, which I had mentioned in the beginning of the episode, and that was the fact that Roland was found in the living room laying on his stomach, while Maram was found in the kitchen laying on her back. Detective Adams also stated the following for the Rutland Daily Herald, quote, It certainly was not the typical Vermont homicide. Ordinarily, we see crimes of passion that got out of hand. This doesn't appear that way, end quote. At first, like within the first few days, it was unclear how many times each of them had been shot, and authorities mentioned that they weren't going to release that, at least not yet anyway. What type of gun may have been used to kill the Hanels, if a murder weapon was found at the scene or not, or how many shots were fired were all things that they seemed to be keeping close. Which obviously I think would be helpful information to know to try and figure out the motive. Which begs the question, or I guess really questions, was this an execution style killing with like one shot to the head or was this like more angry and passion fueled? We don't know where they were shot. Correct. That's one piece that could help. Narrow things down. Narrow things down by the placement of, you know, where they were shot. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm thinking that if it was a handgun that was used, Mm -hmm. they would have had to been shot multiple times in quick succession. Yep. Because if she was found on her back, Mm -hmm. like if you're shot one time, one bullet doesn't necessarily kill people. Doesn't necessarily stop people. Yeah. So if she's- I think people might not- Realize that. Yeah, that's something that's hard to grasp. And like, I never really understood that either. Right, bullets are magic. Yeah. So I'm thinking that If it was a handgun, they were shot multiple times in quick succession, or it could have been something like a shotgun, where it was like one shotgun blast and, you know, they were incapacitated and they just fell where they were. Mm -hmm. You'd have to assume that Roland was shot from behind if he's laying on his stomach. Correct. Yep. I was thinking that. And then Maram, maybe from the front, if she's laying on her back. Mm -hmm. Okay. If I had to guess, like I said, multiple shots with a handgun or 
single shot with maybe a shotgun. Okay, interesting. Well, what Philip White, the Orleans County state attorney, said at the time seemed to provide a little bit more insight into this. He said, quote, To me, the multiple gunshot wounds indicated a relatively cold-blooded killing. With victims of multiple gunshot wounds, there is more of a likelihood of a calculated killing, end quote. So, I mean, now we know that there were multiple gunshot wounds, but no specifics released about where the shots may have been or anything like that. See, if it were a calculated killing, Mm -hmm. wouldn't you think that they would use less rounds to kill them? Yeah, I agree. I would consider multiple shots to be more angry and passion-fueled, like I said before. But what do they know then that we don't know that would make them think that it was calculated, pre-planned, something like that? So what's coming through my head is like if it's pre-planned and calculated and stuff, you would ambush them at a specific time. You would Mm -hmm. get them separated and it would be like the least amount of shots fired necessary Mm -hmm. to kill them. That's what I think of as far as calculated goes. I agree. When you start saying, you know, passion fueled or just unplanned, just spur the moment type thing. Mm -hmm. There's like a a very thin line between, you know, passion fueled Mm -hmm. and unplanned or spur the moment. Mm hmm. Passion fueled is okay. Maybe they were dead, and they shot them three or four more times because they're just so angry. Because or, they're so angry. Yep. Versus someone that doesn't really have a plan and just goes in there, guns blazing. Yeah. Well, I will say, after a little bit of time, a few additional details are uncovered and subsequently released to the public, and those were more so about the scene itself. So, for starters, even though Maram and Roland were found in two different rooms in the house, there was no sign of a struggle which struck me as a little bit odd, and it kind of makes me wonder if there could have been two people involved here to ensure a clean and swift attack. Either that or maybe Roland was the first target. He was killed from behind, Mm -hmm. and then Maram heard some type of commotion, Mm -hmm. went towards the room, or started making her way towards wherever Roland was shot, or wherever she heard the noise from, and then was shot head on because she was going into the room. Yeah, definitely possible. I just think like, Knowing the layout of the house could be helpful to kind of nail that down. Obviously, police know that. We don't, but that's something that I think could be important. Yeah, I mean, if you you go into one of those doors and the first room is the living room Mm -hmm. and then the following room is the kitchen. Exactly. It would make perfect sense. Yeah. All right. The second thing that was released was that there was no motive identified by authorities at this point, but they did state that due to the fact that some money had been left out in the house and not taken... That led them to believe robbery was not the motive here. That was one thing I was going to question was, Mm -hmm. you know, they rented out these properties to people. Did they rent out? Did they get paid cash? Did they keep large sums of cash in the house? Mm -hmm. They didn't drive often, so maybe they just kept, you know, a safe with money in it. Hey, we hear about that all the time with people like not trusting banks. And back in the day, people would keep cash in their mattress. Well, it's interesting to know that that's ruled out now. Yeah. That robbery did not seem to be the motive. Yeah, exactly. And third, it's mentioned that detectives thought the couple may have potentially been killed several days prior to when their bodies were found. Now, just a minute ago, I had mentioned that authorities didn't want to release any information regarding the type of weapon used or number of times each victim was shot. However, after the ME completed the autopsies, the need to keep that information to themselves seemed to change. Dr. Paul Morrow was the medical examiner at the time, and it's reported that he spent nearly 14 hours the Saturday after the couple was found, completing the autopsies on both of their bodies. And once those were completed, more details were released that are certainly helpful to know. So, first of all, it was confirmed that both Maram and Roland had been shot anywhere between 8 to 11 times, and they had, in fact, been deceased for a minimum of 24 hours by the time that friend found their bodies on September 20th. Regarding the bullet wounds, the Burlington Free Press reported the following, quote, Morrow estimated 8 to 11 shots were fired at each after taking into consideration that more than one wound could be caused by a single bullet, end quote. So with that information now, you got to think, could there have been two firearms used? Mm -hmm. Could there have been two people involved? If not, it's one single person that came with multiple magazines, Mm -hmm. unless you have like a large drum magazine that just randomly has, you know, 20 rounds in it. Yeah, that's, I was thinking that's like a big magazine though. Right. Or if it was like not a pistol and Mm -hmm. it was an AR style rifle Mm -hmm. where you have a 30 round magazine as your standard size mag. Yep. All things to think about knowing now that they've each been shot eight to 11 times. Also, in terms of the 24-hour time period since the ME believed Roland and Maram had been killed, 
Dr. Morrow stated that he wasn't fully able to determine or narrow down a more exact time of death, but did say that due to, quote, changes in the bodies, he was able to at least determine that 24-hour time frame that he gave in his autopsy findings. It's also released where Roland and Maram were shot, like in terms of where on their bodies. It was reported that Roland was shot in the head, chest, stomach, arms, legs, and back and Maram was shot in the stomach, chest, and both of her arms. And remember, they were found in those different rooms like we talked about before, and I think that's really important in this case, at least in my opinion. But, John, I'm curious what you think about that. Well, there's more information that I would want to know. Okay. So, when you're entering the house, how far was Roland from the main entry point to the home? That's a good question that I don't have an answer to. say it was 30 feet. Mm -hmm. Say the person wasn't a well-trained shot. I could see, you know... Obviously, you aim center mass, Mm -hmm. but it could have been all over the place. Rounds can be all over the place, especially when your, you know, adrenaline's pumping. Yes. Yep. Heart rate's up. And the legs are what get me. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's all over. It all kind of gets me. So I think outside of like standing over his body and shooting in each extremity, like Mm -hmm. purposefully to like, you know, cause injury or to cause some type of torment to them. Yep. The distance and the lack of their ability to shoot accurately Mm -hmm. could have played a factor in that but with maram you got to think she's being shot head on Mm -hmm. what's your first instinct when somebody's like attacking you or pointing something at you to cover yourself you raise your arms and you cover yourself yep so when you're talking chest and stomach Mm -hmm. center mass yeah where do your arms go when you're covering yourself covering your chest and stomach covering your chest and stomach yeah so that could have been her reaction of trying to you know defend herself or protect Mm -hmm. herself Mm -hmm. and that's why she got shot like that but with roland it's a little weird Yeah, definitely. And there was something else that I wanted to mention, too, and that was that the couple was not shot at super close range due to the lack of powder marks on their bodies. So then that made me want to ask, like, does the gun essentially have to be like almost pressed against the skin in order to leave powder marks like that? Or would it be like within five feet or however many feet away to determine, you know, where gunpowder residue would go, I guess? I'm not an expert on gunpowder residue, but yeah, I think but it depends. Yeah, but you're smarter than me on this, so. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's multiple factors that will either increase or decrease the distance mm-hmm. needed to be fired from to mm-hmm. leave gunshot residue. Yeah. I don't know. I think there are too many factors that could change yeah. how close or how far you have to be for that round or that type of ammunition to leave gunpowder residue. Yeah. I mean, the the person firing it will always have it, mm-hmm. which is why in homicides and stuff like that, detectives will usually, you know, swab hands and stuff. For yep, to see if there's residue. anything. I wonder, I mean, I guess at the end of the day, what we know here is that the person was in the house. I don't know. That's why I want to know the layout of the house. And that's why I'm saying how far was it from the entry point of the house yeah. to where people were shot? Because say they're living or, or they're in that bottom basement area. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking you walk into a living room. And somewhat straight ahead is the kitchen. I can see that, yeah. Is the open to the kitchen. So, you know, this person could have went in that bottom door, shot Roland from, who knows, 20, 30 feet away. Yeah. Didn't have great accuracy. Mm -hmm. Then Maram, Maram, maybe Maram screamed or something like that, came into the room. She covered herself up and then they Mm -hmm. fired on it from there and then was out super quick. Yeah, yeah. Distance, I think, plays a big factor in a lot of different things in this part of the investigation. Yeah, it's always so frustrating, you know, when you just have these little teeny tiny tidbits and it's like, of course you want to help. That's why we're doing this. You know, you want to be able to give different points of view and things like that that maybe authorities aren't thinking or family members or whoever. Yeah, I think that you have to utilize, you know, information that you've gathered from other cases or Mm -hmm. from your own life or investigations that maybe you've been a part of Yeah, in order to come to a general hypothesis on what mm-hmm. could have happened, but there's a lot of information that's left out right now that yep. is hindering the ability to do so. I agree. So it was also reported that the gunshot wounds were the only injuries to the couple. There were no additional wounds found on them. Yeah, so I'm thinking when you already ruled out that robbery is not a motive because there's it doesn't even seem out. like yeah. this person went super far through the house. No, not at all. I'm thinking that this appears to be targeted. Mm-hmm. It appears that Whoever went there, their 
sole mission was to kill these people and get out as fast as possible. I completely agree with that. Yep. Which is probably why they were each shot eight to 11 times. Mm -hmm. Make because sure. Because you want to ensure that whatever job they were doing, if it was like a hired thing mm -hmm. or whatever reason they were going there for, they wanted to ensure that, you know, there were no mistakes mm -hmm. and that these people couldn't survive. Yep. So I'm wondering now who would want to be targeting them because that's what it seems like it is. Agreed. Well, there's definitely, you know, a fair amount of information to go through. So I have a question for you. Sure. Do you think that they could have been targeted because of her ethnicity? That comes up later. Yeah, that's, that's actually that's what I'm thinking. I'm right always now. so interested when you say this stuff where it's like you ask these questions up front and it is a theory that's come up and I'll I'll give you a little bit more information about it later. But I will tell you right now that, yes, you know, that is something that's been considered. So if I just gave you a blanket of information, and I said, hey, just guess, just guess what you think is is going on here. Or or if I told you this, uh, this female who's not very dark skinned. I mean, she has some maybe Middle Eastern type features, mm -hmm. but her name was Maram. Yep. You would think, okay, maybe she's Middle Eastern. Maybe she's a Muslim. Could she have been targeted because of her ethnicity? Maybe this was an interracial relationship that somebody didn't agree with. They're both in a predominantly white area mm -hmm. out in the boonies. Yep. People don't agree with that type of stuff there, maybe. Hey, I mean, it's possible, but I think at least from what I know so far, and what you know so far, that people seem to like them. Mm -hmm. But it only takes one. You are correct about that. Now, in terms of the weapon used to kill the Hanels, it was first stated that authorities did not find a murder weapon at the scene. I mentioned that before. But they still didn't really have any idea what type of gun could have been used in the attack at this point. However, John, like you mentioned before, there could have been the option of a shotgun However, the ME was able to rule that out entirely. He said that it wouldn't have been a shotgun that was used. Well, I would rule that out once you told me that they were each shot 8 to 11 times. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, even in a larger capacity shotgun, you're getting maybe 6 to 8 rounds. Yeah, you're only getting, what, 2 in a shotgun? Oh, is that you were, You can get 6 to 8 in a shotgun? Depending on the shotgun, yeah. Wow, okay, I didn't realize that. I thought it was like 2. Because you well, always that, see those like, like little... That's like your old style double barrel shotgun. Like from Midsummer Murders. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> that's what like I a think. a hunting shotgun or something. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. But like um, I've used before a semi-automatic shotgun where you don't have to like pump or anything. Mm -hmm. We were able to fit six rounds in there. In terms of really trying to narrow down the type of weapon the killer may have used, authorities said they couldn't tell yet what type of gun was used in the attack. Obviously, we know it's not a shotgun, but other than that, they've got no other information for us. If they can't narrow it down, maybe there aren't casings. Okay, hold on. Let me read this quote from the ME to you so mm -hmm. you can have maybe a little bit better understanding where, you know, their their heads are at. So something interesting the ME stated was reported in a UPI article in the Brattleboro Reformer. And he said, quote, The number of gunshot wounds is unusual, and I can't tell if they were fired from a semi-automatic in rapid succession or whether they were single shots from a handgun, end quote. Does that give you a little bit more to go off of? I mean, kind of. I'm wondering what caliber the gunshot wounds were. And caliber is like 9 millimeter, 45, yeah. 22, that? Yeah, okay. but I'm wondering if there weren't any casings left, which would make me think more, you know, calculated this was a hit type yeah, thing. Yeah, so that's what I was going to say. Their, because they picked up all the casings yes. before they left. And if they were shooting from roughly the same area... Mm -hmm. They don't have to go through the house looking for all this ammunition because, mm -hmm. you know, it's ejecting out of the port to the right every time. And you yeah. just boom, boom, boom. You pick you them all up and them, you go. Make sure, you know, you counted the amount, I guess, that were used and you pick up all the casings. Right. Interesting. Okay. So it's tough. If you don't have, I don't know, it, it's hard to narrow that down. Yeah. Without all the information. Without we're only a lot more, without here. Without a lot with, more information, at least. Yeah. We only have very little bit, so. During the first couple days of the investigation, authorities spent their time surveying the scene and the property, speaking to neighbors to try and get an idea of who the Hanels were and what their everyday life was like, and they were also trying to get in touch with the Hanels' loved ones. And I will say, I haven't seen, like, literally anything reported about Roland's family, but I did see that authorities had difficulty getting in touch with Maram's family because they were traveling through Egypt at the time. Investigators were still able to gather some information about the couple, though, and found out quite a bit about them, how they lived, their everyday lives, and where and when the couple may have been last seen. I gave you a pretty good rundown already on who the Hanels were, but there were a few other things that were mentioned that I wanted to touch on. 
First of all, I had said before that the couple was pretty well liked, but there was another comment from actually that same woman whose husband owned the local grocery store that may kind of contradict her previous statement a bit and not in terms of her contradicting herself because she seemed to like the Hanels and that's her opinion to have, but she did make mention that some people in the area didn't really like Roland all too much because, quote, he could be assertive and opinionated, end quote. Also come to find out, apparently Roland had what was described as a, quote, long-standing boundary dispute with a neighbor by the name of Evelyn Bryant. And I guess there was even some, like, giant fence put up between their two properties. And I honestly don't know if Evelyn put up the fence or if Roland did or whatever, but there seemed to be some neighbor issues going on there. But I will say, investigators did rule out the neighbor as having any involvement in Roland and Maram's murders. At least, that's what it seems like to me just based on what I've read about this. But I think the main reason that they ruled her out was because she wasn't even in the Vermont area at the time. She'd been down in Texas when they were killed. Just because she's not around doesn't mean you can rule her out Agreed. As being yes. involved. Yes, that was the reason that was given to the press. Maybe they have more, but it does seem like they ruled her out. They ruled her out as physically being involved, but that doesn't necessarily rule somebody out from you know, financially being involved. Yeah, you're not wrong there. So at this point, in terms of motive, if the land dispute supposedly wasn't it, and if investigators had ruled out the option of robbery, I mean, what else could it have been? Well, it didn't really seem like authorities had any answers to that at this point. But regardless of motive, investigators were trying to nail down a more concrete timeline of when the couple was last seen, and were trying to piece together the details to sort of dwindle down the window of time regarding when they could have been killed, especially since the ME couldn't definitively determine anything, I have to think that this part of the investigation was probably just going to take some good old-fashioned police work to confirm. Well, unfortunately, this was just yet another confusing piece to this puzzle. So it seems as though the last confirmed sighting of the two was at their home on Gendron Road on September 14th, 1984, sometime around 7.30 p.m., which was six days prior to when the bodies were found. But there was supposedly another sighting at a gas station somewhere nearby, but Authorities said based on the state of the bodies when they were found that there's no way they could have been seen at this gas station or really anywhere for that matter the night before. However, Detective Johnson, the lead on the case, told the Burlington Free Press the following regarding the gas station sighting. Quote, it seems improbable, but what can I say? I've talked with the attendant a couple of times now and she swears she saw them, end quote. And I have seen it mentioned a time or two that there was even another witness who said they'd also seen the Hanels at the gas station the night prior. So overall, it seems like this sighting really caused some confusion for authorities, especially based on what Detective Johnson said. How could them being at the gas station less than 24 hours prior to their bodies being found have even been possible? What other factors could there have been to maybe accelerate the decomposition process? Because I'm thinking that that's why the ME is saying at least 24 hours, right? I guess, but I'm wondering about, like, the scene of the crime. There have to be indicators that they were shot where their bodies laid. Yeah, yep, I would say so. so. Maybe, like, how dry... Sure, like the state of the blood on the floor, rigor mortis. Mm -hmm. Those are the indicators. And, I mean, if you're saying at least 24 hours, it, it, rigor had probably set in pretty substantially. Yeah. Blood pooling in the body still creates coloration on the body. Yep, So. Mm -hmm. Well, even with the last sightings being difficult to pin down, that wasn't the only hindrance to this investigation. One of the most frustrating things in this case, and I feel like we hear about this somewhat often, is that the sound of gunshots was not out of the ordinary in the area. Remember, this is literally one of the most northern and super rural areas in Vermont. Gunshots were not uncommon, and to top it all off, apparently bear hunting season had just begun, which, according to the Vermont Fish and Wildlife website, at least based on today's rules, starts on September 1st and goes through roughly the middle of November. So just based on that alone, I think there were likely even more people shooting their guns, which, again, would not be a cause for concern. A man named James, who I believe to have been a neighbor of the Hanels, told the Burlington Free Press the following, quote, I hear guns all day long. It's bear season, so you wouldn't think it was anything unusual, end quote. I don't know. I understand the sentiment of that to an extent, but if you hear anywhere between 16 to 22 rounds fired off in quick succession, that's a lot different than hearing one or two rounds to take down a bear. Hey, I mean, you're not wrong there, but their bodies were found on a Thursday. Let's say, even if they were killed between 24 hours and like three days prior, that's a weekday. 
So how many people were actually in the area? Because I mentioned before that most people spent their weekends there. So if there's not that many people around and they're not that close by, they might not have thought anything of it. I guess, but if these people are all similar to Roland and Maram and they Mm -hmm. rent out their properties, there are people around. There might have been, but Maram and Roland didn't have any tenants at the time. I know, but I'm saying general people in the area. And if this is a ski town and there are people out, you know. Yeah, so there might not have been as many people around. That's all I'm saying. So like if you're not paying attention or if, say, you're just skiing and you're not at the house. That's fine, but when I'm working, there's a gun range Mm -hmm. in the area where I'm working. Mm -hmm. And yes, I hear rounds going off all the time. But if I heard 16 or 22 rounds, I'd be like, is there a shooting happening because somebody's Or is there anything killed? going on right. around here? Yeah, that's so. crazy. So, I mean, I get what you're saying. I maybe see it a little bit differently, but we'll agree to disagree. I think we can come to terms where, yes, we understand that like gunshots are not out of the ordinary and people hear them frequently. Yeah. But when you hear shots frequently, mm-hmm. it's usually, you know, bang, bang, whatever. Yeah. Or just one, maybe five are, even. Right, those are not yeah, out of the ordinary. Is a lot. When you hear boom, 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 you know, it's like. Yeah, concerning. That, that would stand out at least. I agree. Yeah, all right, fine. We'll agree to agree. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point, with barely any leads, no suspects, and no motive, authorities appeared to be stuck on this investigation from the very beginning. However, there was some buzz in the news about someone that could have been involved, but I don't know how confident I am regarding this person's potential involvement, but let me just tell you what's reported. So a man by the name of Loman Mays had made his way onto police's radar, but not at first for the murder of the Hanels. Mays was actually an escaped convict and had been in prison in Tennessee after he was convicted of murder and multiple other crimes and then sentenced to life in prison based on Tennessee's habitual offender law. But apparently, on July 1st, 1984, Mays was able to escape from prison along with two other inmates. Then, on September 14th, 1984, there was a robbery at the Howard Bank in Orleans County, Vermont, which is the same county Jay is in, which, again, is where the Hanel's house was. The bank was located roughly 20 miles south of Roland and Maram's home. Well, I guess Mays became a suspect in this robbery, most likely because he almost perfectly matched the description of the man who robbed the bank. But at this point, he was only a suspect in the robbery and nothing else. But due to the fact that there was a violent criminal in the area, investigators couldn't look away from the idea that maybe he had some involvement in their murder. Maybe, but unlikely. Yes, that's why I said I'm not very confident, but there's a little bit more. Sid Adams told the Rutland Daily Herald, quote, We're looking at him very strongly as a suspect in the bank robbery. Because of that, he is obviously being connected with the homicide to some extent. We don't have all that many violent people running around up here in Orleans County, end quote. And it seems like the biggest thing was that investigators were trying to place Loman Mays in the J area during the time frame in which the Hanels could have been murdered. Which, okay, maybe that seems somewhat promising because the last confirmed sighting of the Hanels outside of the whole confusing gas station sighting, was on the 14th, which was the same day the bank was robbed. So, so far, those dates are matching up. Mm, I'm still skeptic. Agreed. But Sid Adams also told the Rutland Daily Herald the following, quote, He is being considered. I don't think he has risen to the status of a suspect yet. Were we able to place him in North Vermont in the beginning of the week? Sure, he'd be a suspect, end quote. And I had mentioned before that authorities had pretty much ruled out the idea of robbery being the motive here, but I guess it wasn't like fully confirmed if like nothing had been taken from the Hanel's home, but I think if cash was left out, not much else could have been taken. Unless someone was looking for something specific. And I say that because I guess at least one of the Hanel's cabinets had been rummaged through, so maybe there was something specific the perp wanted to find, but... Just knowing May's history with robbery, I don't think this is fitting for me at this point. No, I don't think so either. And I don't think that it's a clean enough, or, or I think the, the murders are too clean from a lack of evidence standpoint mm-hmm. being left behind yeah. to connect to this guy. This guy. <laughs> exactly. Now, Mays had escaped from prison in July of 84, and it seems as though he was pretty good at hiding from the law because he wasn't actually apprehended until September of 1985, literally over a year later. And this dude was arrested in frickin' Wyoming. 
He had made wow. it like completely across the country. Tennessee, Vermont, Wyoming. Mm-hmm. He was also supposedly in multiple other places doing all sorts of messed up stuff while he was out. But Back in the day, man, it was a lot easier to get away, to hide, and mm-hmm. not so easy anymore. No, definitely not. But he was never charged in connection with Roland and Maram's murders. And as much as I don't think this guy is involved, there was one weird comment that I found that kind of makes me wonder if Jay was a common place for fugitives or escapees or honestly just criminals in general because of its proximity to the Canadian border. So one of the Hanel's neighbors that I mentioned before, that guy James, well, he'd talked to a reporter for the Burlington Free Press. The article states that James, quote, said the homicides were disturbing, particularly after an escaped convict was found in Jay just a few months ago, end quote. The thing about this comment, though, that I can't quite pin down is if it's about Mays or another person that could have been in the area. Just based on when this article was written, I think it is about someone else, but I can't confirm for sure. But either way, I still don't think Loman Mays is responsible for killing Roland and Maram, but I thought it was kind of interesting to connect that comment with Mays, and then the potential for maybe another violent criminal to have been in the area that we don't even know about. Well, if he escaped with two other people, could they all have been traveling together? No, they ended up going their own separate way and got in some like sort of shootout, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, and they got arrested relatively quickly. All right. Yeah, I'm still not on board with Loman Mays being involved. No, me either. Sure, you go and you rob this bank. You're later found in Wyoming. You're Mm -hmm. clearly trying to get away from the area where you were incarcerated in. Yep, definitely. How would you end up at this, you know, middle of nowhere house Mm -hmm. to kill these people, not steal everything in there? Mm -hmm. Like if you're looking for a means to get out of there, yep, could have stolen their car, Mm -hmm. could have taken all the money that was in the house, all their belongings. Mm -hmm. Just doesn't seem right. Yeah, agreed. So after this quick flurry in the news, not much else is reported in the case until September of 1986 two years after the Hanels were killed. Around this time, something very interesting is released, and that's an FBI profile. The FBI Behavioral Science Unit had assisted with the case, and they finished the profile roughly around that September 86 timeframe, so it was then released once it was completed. However, I only found one article that even gave any information from the profile, and that was in the Rutland Daily Herald. This case was so underreported and honestly still is today. It's absurd. But either way, before I get all riled up regarding the lack of coverage on this case, let's discuss the profile. So the Rutland Daily Herald gave like a few bullet points of things that were discussed in the profile. It reads as follows, quote, The killer is in the same age group as the Hanels and would make a good appearance within the community. The killer may have been under the influence of drugs or alcohol and may have been in a dreamlike state. The killer made an attempt to mislead the police in their investigation, end quote. But this next comment in this same article is what really got me. It states, quote, The report also said certain aspects of the crime scene led investigators to believe that at some time a female dominated the killer's life. There is also a strong possibility that at least one other person knows or suspects who the killer is, and that person could be in danger, end quote. What on earth could they mean by the killer potentially having a female dominating their life? And my follow-up question to that would be, could this have actually been two people, one of which was the female who may have been in control? I don't think so. No? Okay, tell me your thoughts. My first thought is an overbearing mother. Okay. And I'm thinking, just because we know of the feud... Okay, yeah. Did the female that Roland was having this land dispute with have a son? And the mother And the mother knows that her son did this. I mean, she was gone. Like I said, just because she was gone Mm -hmm. doesn't mean she's totally removed from this. Yeah. That's my first thought. Just because we know that they're a player in this somehow. Yeah, okay. I see what you're saying. And I'm thinking, yes, an overbearing mother like that. Okay, because when I was like, what do they mean by like a female dominating their life? Does that also mean then that they think that the killer is a male? I think so. Yeah. I'm assuming that the killer is a male. Yep. I think that this is just me creating a profile out of my ass right now because I know nothing about these other people. (laughs) Yeah. All right. We just finished watching Sharp Objects. Oh, yeah. That's probably why overbearing mother is coming into your mind. (laughs) (laughs) No, but I'm thinking picture Evelyn as the mother, you know, wants to look good in the community, Mm -hmm. has a, 
a son who she's overbearing with, but the profile says has a good standing in the community mm-hmm. around the same age. Yeah. You know, if Evelyn was older and they had a son or she had a son. Yeah. That was roughly the same age. I mean, well, here's what's different to me, though. Roland's 49 and Maram's 32. That's so that's a big age say. range. Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. So if it's between that age range, they're given a lot. Say Evelyn's in her 60s. Mm-hmm. She could very easily have a son that's between 32 and 49. Yeah. Yeah. If she and Roland are having this dispute over land, mm-hmm. she must have a fair amount of land. He has a fair amount of land. They have but like, their is dispute. it worth killing someone over? That's ridiculous. Well, think, think of an overbearing mother. If this thing like really, th- this dispute that she had with Roland mm-hmm. really like was a hot ticket item for her, mm-hmm. and she was constantly talking about it, taking it out on her son. I mean, and she ran I don't the son's know. Life. I don't know if she did that. Like, there's no information about her or that whole situation out there. I know, but... I, I, I get that, but I'm just saying I'm pulling this out of my ass. She might not yeah. even have a son. Yeah, but <laughs> that's, that's what I'm thinking. Just because we know that she's a player in this, and I had said, oh, just because she's gone doesn't mean that he, that she can't be involved somehow. Mm-hmm. I'm only saying this or putting this together because we know that this person, Evelyn, had a problem with the Hanels. Yeah, no, I see what you're saying. I'm just like. I guess, like, taking little pieces of this profile, too. And, like, what does this mean? Like, oh, they're under the influence of drugs or alcohol and could have been in a dreamlike state. They could have taken acid. They could have taken LSD. They could have could taken something. Could that be something. why there were so many shots? It could have been why there were so many shots. Or it could have been, like, you know, you have this overbearing mother. This big hot ticket item is constantly a problem. Maybe she's taking it out on the son. And the son's like, And the son's this. like, I'm going to fix this problem while my mother's gone. Mm-hmm. Just a guess. But hey, I mean, that's it's definitely possible. I mean, anything been, anything is possible. Could have went on a bender. This is totally out there, but say she was like, I'm getting out of here. You better fix this before I get back. Yeah. And then the guy's on a bender. He's drinking heavily. He's taking drugs. And then all of a sudden, he's just like, I'm going to do this because he's all fucked up. Yeah. I mean, I think everything what, that you're saying is possible. It just, it's like one of those things where you wish you knew more information about the people around the area, things like that, and so it's, you could piece this stuff together. Yes, and this this whole scenario is possible even if it's not Evelyn that it, exactly is it could the be someone else entirely, person. right? But that's what I picture when you say you know an overbearing woman or a female a, a dominating. female dominating their life. Yeah, I that's totally. What I think. Yeah, I see what you're saying, and I don't think like say you're looking at like a husband and wife relationship. Mm. Even if the the male is like a beta male that lets the wife run the show and Mm -hmm. is like domineering over them or whatever Mm -hmm. i feel i don't know it's just something where i feel like it is a mother controlling a son like a middle-aged son Mm -hmm. more so than a wife or a girlfriend controlling their significant other yeah i i see that too i would probably lean more along those lines as well but outside of this like the profile that was released Not one single thing is reported on in this case until 2000. So another 14 years went by before anything else was discussed in the media. This article in the Caledonian Record in 2000, I guess maybe sort of clears up some theories, but I think, at least for me, it kind of leaves me feeling more lost on what's going on. Oh, and apparently there had been a lot of interest in this case internationally, but I couldn't find anything reported on from other countries other than Canada, so maybe it was just because both of their families were from other countries, so word got around that way, didn't make it to the media, something like that, but who knows. Either way, let's go over what this article reveals regarding the investigation up until that point, which was 2000. So I guess people had previously speculated that Roland and Maram's murders could have been a mob killing because of the way the couple was so brutally executed. I don't know if I agree with that theory, though, because from what I can tell, nothing has ever been uncovered regarding them having any involvement in that world. Yeah, and you have an FBI profile where you should put more weight into that, more so than rumors and speculation from the community. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the profile that the FBI put out is not indicative, but it, it, it doesn't mesh with like a mob killing. No, not at all. So others thought that it could have something to do with the fact that the Hanels were foreign, like you mentioned earlier, John, which honestly, that seems pretty messed up at first glance, but there is a reason why it was brought up in the first place. So one of the theories that had been brought up in terms of this whole idea was in regards to Maram specifically. Some people believed she could have been a target because of something that had happened in her past. 
So back in 1972, Maram had worked for the Summer Olympics that were being held in Munich, Germany. And one of the biggest reasons why Maram had been hired for this job at the Olympics was due to her knowledge of multiple languages. But I guess members of this group named the Black September Palestinians had kidnapped nine athletes from Israel that were supposed to be competing in the Olympic Games. Well, this group, the Black September Palestinians, was a terrorist organization. I guess after the athletes were kidnapped, German police were not able to save them, and all nine athletes were killed. Jeez. Seriously. From the Olympics, you'd think that that would be such like a black mark on the Olympic Games that like, I've never heard of that. I, this was the first time I ever heard of it. I mean, it is the 70s, but still. Still. But authorities, however, do not believe that Maram had any involvement in the abduction and subsequent deaths of athletes from Israel, which, I mean, I think that's kind of freaking obvious, but still. Like, so people were like, oh, well, this happened in her past, so maybe it's connected. I think that what? is, like, grasping at straws, right? No, I thought that, like, you were going to say that she was used as, you know, a translator to talk to this terrorist organization to try and get them back during the negotiations or something. No, there's, like, nothing. There's, like, literally <laughs> nothing. It was like, oh, my God, she was... How old would she have been, too, back then? Like, she would have been so young. She was probably, like, a teenager. Like, maybe it was, like, a summer job. Well, you were job. talking 72. If, yeah. she was, if she was 30... Two and 84. She was 32 and 84. Yeah, you're talking... Like, 14, yeah. 16. Like, she was young. So I'm like, I don't well, know 84, where... 84 to 72, she would have been 20. Oh, t- wow, I cannot math. Yeah. I think that's something people will learn. <laughs> <laughs> but people also speculated that the murders could have been some sort of retribution killing. The Caledonian record reported, quote... Speculation arose whether the Hanel's death, particularly her Arab descent, and he, a German native, was a retribution killing. Even by Israeli secret police, considering the Yugoslav ammunition used in the 9mm murder weapons were also used in Israeli manufactured semi automatic guns. And murder quote. weapons. Did you catch that? I caught that. Ooh, I was like, was that a slip? Was that on purpose? Why is that being revealed? Was that a mistake? Was that a mistake? I don't know. But when I read that, I said, even if none of this other stuff about the Israeli athletes and the terrorist group and all of that, at the end of the day, we might have just gotten a nugget there. I don't think we did. You don't think we got a nugget? I think that's a mistake on the journalistic part. Yeah. Because remember the FBI profile? The Mm. FBI has all that information. Yeah, that's true. And they didn't put out anything to say. Multiple people. Mm hmm. They said, which I still think it could have been possible. I don't know. Based on what you said, though, about Maram, maybe like walking from the kitchen towards the living room. Maybe it could have been one person. I'm not totally ruling out the idea of two, but I still think it it could go either way in my my brain. It could be one person with two weapons, too. That's also true. Yeah. I didn't think of that. I don't know. Knowing that the FBI profile made it out to be this one person that was like controlled by their female in their life or a Mm -hmm. female in their life Mm -hmm. it seems to be one person yep maybe it was a slip up with the s the the murder weapons because if it's only been reported in 2000 and it was never put out anywhere else why did they have this information yeah and nobody else did but like also is she maybe talking about the murder weapons used to kill the israeli athletes maybe i don't know i don't know that whole like sentence just confused me because it was like oh considering that the ammunition was similar or however she said it it's like i mean knowing that the ammunition is similar that's good information but is it like i don't know the way that that's written just kind of confuses me it's like what are you even talking about are you talking about their murder are you talking about the murder of the israeli athletes yeah i don't know but the article seems confusing yeah and i think that it was probably a mistake or it's like misconstrued And like it was meant to discuss more of that, the Olympic game situation rather than Maram and Roland's murder. Right. If the FBI is brought into this investigation to make a profile, they have all of that information available Mm -hmm. and they made it seem like it's one person. Agreed. Yeah. All of their stuff does not fit with that. But there was one other theory that was discussed, and that was that they could have been involved with drugs in some capacity or another, particularly because of the boat Roland owned in Florida. But again, like I mentioned regarding the mob theory, there was never any evidence that they were involved with drugs or drug smuggling or anything like that at all, which police also did state publicly. So I think this is just like something that we talk about all the time where it's like you're coming up with theories that aren't based in anything factual. Right. You can be like, maybe, you know, 
aliens came down and they had guns and they shot them. Oh, right. You can come it's up with the most ridiculous reality. thing. Yeah. You need some facts. You need some evidence to help formulate your opinion. Yeah. Or your hypothesis. Or it's like, theory. oh, he owns a boat in Florida. He must be a drug smuggler. Like, right. that's just the <laughs> silliest thing to come up with. And it's like, there's nothing that's ever been stated. Whereas with the FBI profile, you can kind of piece things together about things that you know from the area or, you know, something like that. You have a concrete thing in hand from the authorities saying this is what we think the perpetrator is like rather than someone owned something in a certain area that could, you know, connect them with this nefarious group. Right. And investigators would have access to that information. Yeah. They would be privy to bank accounts mm -hmm. that the deceased owned. Did they have a Swiss bank account with $30 million mm -hmm. in it? All right, maybe they were involved in drugs. Well, if it was a but, drug thing too, why would cash have been left in the house? And whoever, yeah. like usually drug things, at least in my naive mind, are about money. On a, so, smaller, on a smaller scale, yes. Yeah. But on a larger scale? Retribution? Maybe. I mean, I don't know. Could have ticked off the wrong person and they don't care about money because they have so much money. Then they did it. But uh, this yeah. is so far out there that I don't think... I don't think it has any bearing on what really happened. Yeah, I agree. So during that 16-year time span from when the murders first occurred to when that article was released in the Caledonian Record, the case had been reopened several times with dozens of leads tracked down, including some out of the country, but there was still nothing of note uncovered, and if there was, it wasn't released publicly. I would have to say, just I, I want to go back to my theory about Evelyn and maybe a son and stuff like that. I just want to make clear that I, I was building that theory around her because we knew her as a player involved. Mm -hmm. We don't know if she has a son or anything. And I assume if the FBI put out this profile and Evelyn had a son, they, they would probably, probably be looking into, into her. It. Exactly. So right. I think that's why I don't necessarily think that there was any involvement there, especially because they ruled her out. But that does not mean not that there could have similar. been some other dispute going on in the area that wasn't talked about because maybe it was a more promising lead or something along those lines. Or maybe it sure. was just something that never crossed police's desk and they never heard about it. And it very well could have been overlooked, too. Exactly. You never yes, know. totally possible. I will say, overall, it seems like the biggest hindrance in this case has to do with the inability to determine the motive for the killings. Lieutenant Robert White, who was the head of the State Police Bureau of Criminal Investigations Division at the time, told the Caledonian Record, quote, we were never able to establish a motive for the murders, end quote. It continues with him saying, quote, the case is still open. There's nothing new to report, end quote. Which makes me so curious, like, if nothing, like, literally, it seems like nothing changed on this case in 16 years. Now, 22 years later, with not one single thing reported on, is the case still the same? Is there more information? Why aren't we hearing anything? It's really annoying to me. This is just like last week's case, where it's like, why is the last discussion on this case from 22 years ago and all you're getting is like a handful of of like I think one podcast and like one YouTube channel I could find that had even talked about this case and you know read it in web sleuths that's all you're getting like why isn't there more unless you're looking at it from an investigative standpoint there's not a whole lot to talk about yeah now with the FBI profile I've been referring to it almost as gospel like oh if the FBI put this out then you know I mean I don't know I like profiles but that's just my love of criminal minds so Sure, but I like profiles, but also people making profiles are still human and they can be incorrect. Of course, yep, that's very true. Some of the things in the profile could be accurate, some could be wrong. The overbearing woman in the person's life or the woman who's dominated their life could be inaccurate, but drugs and alcohol in a dreamlike state mm -hmm. could be accurate. Yeah. And if that's the case and they were just going fucking crazy mm -hmm. and they went out and killed somebody... Mm -hmm. It's really hard to put a motive on that if it was just like, you know, they were fucked up on drugs and maybe they went out bear hunting or whatever. If somebody is totally not there mentally and it's mm -hmm. just, you know. They're like tripping or right. whatever. Like they don't really have full control of what they're doing. How and, are you ever going to have a motive on that? Yeah. And, and it's totally possible that there really isn't one. So maybe that's why they haven't been able to nail one down. But it's interesting you say that, too, about, you know, the potential for a profile to be wrong because... It seems to me, at least, that authorities didn't quite agree with the profile, saying that they didn't think the killer was local to the Jay area. They did suspect at one point it could have been a retribution killing, but they never officially confirmed that as being the motive. 
They again said they still had no idea what the motive was. Overall, Lieutenant White said that the Hanels, quote, both were fine, upstanding, honest people, end quote. So something that I think we'll get into, I don't know if you're ready to do the questions we're left with portion yet. Well, yes, I am, because that's literally freaking it on this case. (laughs) Like, we have gone over everything that's ever been released, and the last article was from 22 years ago, and there is not one single ounce of additional information out there. So to get into this portion, then, the questions we're left with. Mm Mm-hmm. One of them I have revolves around the Hanels renting out their property Mm -hmm. and what you said earlier about Roland being opinionated and assertive. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if authorities are thinking that it was not somebody from the area Mm -hmm. and they're not looking at their community through rose-tinted glasses. Mm -hmm. Could it have been somebody that had rented the property and maybe Roland got into, you know, a little verbal tiff with them Mm -hmm. and maybe they came back? Well, it's interesting you say that because this just brought to my mind something that we just talked about the other day. And that has to do with like reacting in certain situations that maybe you should just like you can control yourself and you can control your own reactions to somebody else. For example, like when you're driving and somebody does something absolutely ridiculous and you want to lay on your horn and, you know, flip out on them and give them the bird and whatever. But in reality, you don't know who that other person is, how they're going to react if it's going to turn into this crazy road rage situation or something and they're going to try and harm you because you never know how somebody else is feeling, what somebody else is thinking or what that other person might be capable of. So that brings me to what you were saying is, could he have just been upset with how this renter acted? Maybe somebody Mm -hmm. trashed his apartment or did whatever and he got into it with them and he got into it with the wrong person. Obviously, People react like you just do. Like I've done it before. You've done it before where it's like you get pissed off in the moment and you say something and then maybe that other person wasn't totally reasonable and they might want to get back at you. Right. So I think that's a really good point to make that something like that could have been the reason. Sure. So my question that goes along with that that I'd Mm -hmm. like to have answered is were there records kept Mm -hmm. of who stayed there when they stayed there? Mm. Were these people contacted and vetted? Yeah, that's a good question. Definitely. Like, did he do background checks or was it just like, oh, you just come in? Like, it's not like it is today. I'm thinking more, were they vetted by police? I see. Okay. Like if they had, if the Hanels kept some type of log Mm -hmm. of who stayed there, was that log kept in the one cabinet that was rummaged through? Hey. Was evidence taken and destroyed? Yeah. That's where I'm going with that question. Okay. That's a good question. Were people that had been staying there before, were they contacted? Were they vetted? Was there even a record of who had stayed there before? Mm Mm-hmm. My other question was, why was the friend coming over that day? That I don't know. I cannot nail it down. I'm not sure who the friend was or what their, you know, relationship was. I have seen like a couple people randomly on like Reddit and stuff say, oh, this was like a family friend of mine or whatever. But nobody else has ever said anything about who Mm -hmm. it was, why they were going over there or anything like that. It may be totally inconsequential, but maybe, you know, every Thursday they went out to ride their bikes. Yes, Totally. And that's why he was coming would over. Would make sense. Yeah. That's why they were coming over. Mm hmm. You have any other questions that go along with these two? Well, it's funny you say that because literally my questions are um, literally everything. Because <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there's just so much we don't know. And yeah. surprisingly, though, even though there's not a lot about the investigation here, we know a lot about the Hanels. A fair this amount, is a yeah. case where, like, you have a good amount of information on them and their life and where they were from and the things that they did and what they enjoy doing. But the thing, okay, well, I guess this now leads me into my next question, which is, what's up with their families? My thing that I just thought of while you were going through that, we know Mm -hmm. a lot about them. What about Maram's family? Mm -hmm. Were they happy that she married this German guy, this German white guy, if she's from, you know, the Middle East or Egypt area? Mm -hmm. Was that like a taboo thing? I'm not sure. I mean, it seemed like they were trying to get in touch with their family. I don't know what either of their familial relationships were like. Did she even have contact with her family after she married... Roland? I don't know. And you have to think, too, Maram was Roland's second wife. So I don't know if that has any bearing on this. Like, who Mm -hmm. was his first wife? Did they have a good relationship? Mm -hmm. What other family members may have lived nearby to him? I mean, he was from Germany, then moved to Canada. Like, did his family move to Canada? Well, if it's somebody in the same age range and, say, Roland had a nasty divorce with his first wife, Mm -hmm. was his first wife, like, overbearing and dominant? And that's why they got divorced. And now she was dominant to this other guy that she was now with. Mm -hmm. Could that be the dominant relationship that was listed in the profile? And maybe she was pissed off about 
you know, not getting enough money through the divorce. He clearly made a, a substantial amount of money yeah, selling the business. Yep. Maybe she was pissed off about that. Like I said, I didn't know if there were extenuating circumstances on why he sold the business. Well, which this whole portion leads me into my next question mm-hmm. is what happened to the property after they were killed? This is the thing. Like, I am Did that Evelyn person. Did buy it up? Hey, maybe. At like an auction? Did it go to his ex-wife? What happened to the property and all of his stuff? Because they didn't have kids, yeah, right? Yeah, no. Not that so, I know of. I don't know if he had any from his first marriage, but mm-hmm. it did not seem like he and Maram had any kids. Yeah, so what happened to the property and all of their belongings and their money and everything? Mm-hmm. What happened after they were killed? Yeah, that's definitely a good question. Um, I mean, they were young. I doubt they had a living will unless... For one reason or another, they wanted to make sure that if they were to die unsuspectingly, Mm -hmm. their assets went to somebody in particular. Yeah, I don't know. I just feel like I'm I'm sitting here and like my brain's not working on this case Mm -hmm. because there are just so many things that we don't know that would all be very important to know. And that's, of course, why we now do this questions we're left with segment. So we're ever churning through this stuff, these investigations. While we're doing these questions we're left with, maybe somebody's listening. They're like, oh, that's a really good question. Maybe I can dive into this and really find the answer. Yeah. And then they can get back to us. And mm-hmm. then we can say, oh, I love good. the deep divers. And I feel like we just talk about Uncovered in every episode. But right. that's like all the people at Uncovered. They're like the best deep dive researchers out there. And I wish I could be like them. <laughs> like I try so hard to be good at it. But like it's You do a their... great deep dive. I try. But I think it's really hard, though, like when you're looking into a case, I could give you, you know, 30 more questions that you should research, but Mm -hmm. it could be time wasted because you never get the answer. The information you find could be inconsequential and not really matter. Yeah. But if somebody were really interested in this particular case. Yeah. And these questions may lead to answers that maybe investigators never found or uncovered Mm -hmm. before Mm -hmm. could get answers, you know, decades later. Yeah, I think I would really love to see. Maybe we need an I, I would love to see section, but like I would love to see authorities give a little bit more now. Yeah. It's been a long time. Mm-hmm. It has been a very long time, almost 40 years and 22 years of not one single ounce of info. No, so, I mean, 86 was the last good bit of info with the Well, profile. I mean, they went over the theories in 2000. They talked about how they went to other countries went- and how they ruled stuff out, but- 86 was the last bit of information that, like, information to give us. Yeah. To help us formulate an idea. Yeah. Whereas, you know, later on, they released, like, a summary of what they've done. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that they didn't miss something while doing that. Yeah. It just makes me think of John William Leonard Sr., though, like we talked about in the case updates. Like, there is now a sketch out there for his case. Like, they didn't get, that's not, like everything they have on the case, but they gave a really good big piece of info to the public to try and help. Mm -hmm. What could they do in this case? What kind of big piece of info do police have that wouldn't destroy their case? And quite honestly, 40 years later, like, do you actually think this person is around? They might not be. I agree. And a piece of information that they could put out is coming from one of my other questions. Did they narrow down the number of murder weapons used? Mm -hmm. Are they... Talk about the murder weapon in general. Did you nail that down? So through the autopsy, I'm sure they found the rounds that were still within the Hanel's bodies. Mm -hmm. Did they have different markings? Did they come from different weapons? Yeah. That would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Did you find prints? Did you find, I mean, I don't know, like, was there blood spatter analysis? Can you determine how tall the killer was? What type of things were in the cupboard that was rummaged through? Yeah. Was it like a cupboard for glasses or like did they keep important paperwork or medication in there? Did they keep a list of their tenants? Renters, their tenants. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I think these are all little things and I know this is just me and my two cents and I am not in law enforcement but it is what it is. Like This is just my opinion on it. Like, I think they could give something like that and it wouldn't be a huge hindrance to an investigation. Right. I mean, you can't hinder an investigation any more than not going anywhere for (laughs) 22 years, you know? Exactly. Like, this goes back to our whole meaningful movement conversation. Like, it seems like there's zero movement. You releasing something is not going to set the case back. Exactly. And I just wanted to go back to, like, the question about their families. I just don't know why 
there just isn't any information out there about them. Like it doesn't have to do with like if they don't want to talk to the press, that's their prerogative. If they don't want to be involved, if they, you know, obviously if they're living in other countries, it's probably a lot more difficult to get on law enforcement, things like that. Nothing at all. No issue with however the families handled this. I'm just curious, you know, why nobody even knows their names. Like, you know, I do all these cases and it's like, oh, so and so's you know, grew up in whatever town with mom and dad, whoever. And, you know, you still at least get a little bit of background on their early life and who their parents were or who their siblings were, things like that. I can't find anything. Right, I couldn't even find obituaries. I mean, you're talking other countries now. Yeah. Outside of Canada, like, sure, Canada, you should be able to find something, I would I, I would assume. Mm-hmm. But when you're talking Egypt, I mean, we're talking over the pond. Or Germany, now. too. I mean, we don't know if Roland's family moved to Canada with him. It could have mm-hmm. just been him moving to Canada. And same right. with Maram. Right. And with Maram, it could be a cultural thing where maybe they weren't happy that she married this, you know, white guy from Germany, a Canadian. Mm-hmm. And they cut ties and they didn't talk to each other anymore. Yeah. I'm just really curious. Like, I would love to know where they are, if they're fighting for more answers and maybe they're not getting anywhere. These are all things, you know, that I just, I would like to know about the family. But... Mm-hmm. With that, if you know anything at all about who killed Roland and Maram Hanel, please contact Captain Scott Dunlap with the Vermont Major Crime Unit at 802-244-8781. Thank you all so much for tuning in every week. We're so happy to have you here. Make sure to leave us a five-star review before you go and follow us on our socials. You can follow us on Instagram at wicked.deeds.podcast and on Twitter at Wicked Deeds. Don't forget to visit our website, wickeddeedspodcast.com, to take a look at any photos from this episode and view our source material. But most importantly, tune in next week for an all-new episode. <laughs>